mentioned earlier, um, my day job is as an analyst. Um, so I'm going to give a few kind of comments to frame our discussion today before we get into some of our speakers. About three years ago, um, I, did, I started to detect this trend, which I've started to call um, the law of sevens. So it essentially goes that every decade, at that decade's respective seventh year, so 87, 97, 2007, there is a hardware innovation that um, is really an inflection point in the way that we consume media and the way we communicate. Um, so the first kind of element of the, the law of sevens uh, was this. You guys all remember this? So this is um, from the movie Wall Street. This is Michael Douglas playing Gordon Gecko on a beach somewhere in Southampton, um, talking on this phone, which we all now refer to as the brick. Does anyone remember the, the name of this phone? Motorola? It's a Motorola, the, the, the model number or name? Or not the number, sorry. Well, you could say anything, and I believe you. I don't know the number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the Dynatac, but it's probably TI something, right. Um, so anyway, this, this was 1987. And at, this was a key moment, because this was the, for the first time that film audiences saw what is possible with mobile telephony. Um, and, it, and it blew people away. And it sounds silly now, because this is so antiquated to us now. But at the time, it was very novel. And it really became um, kind of a defining moment in terms of the aspirations that drove the next 10 years of kind of mobile telephony innovation. 10 years later, 1997, we had the Motorola StarTac. So this was the first, or actually 97 was around the time it really started to ramp up. I think it actually came out in 1996, but it ramped up in terms of global penetration. Um, first of its kind in terms of a form factor that ruled the next 10 years, which was the flip phone. And then in 2007, you guys all know what happened in 2007. IOS. Yep, and well, the iPhone, and, and yes, the, the first iOS, that's correct. Um, so this was interesting too because Unlike those past iterations, we had for the first time a really robust software and graphical interface. So that became the foundation for many, many years up until now of third party innovation, content development, app development, and new use cases. And that's a key point that I'll come back to. Um, it really just became a, a foundation for a lot of that innovation. So about three years ago when I came up with this, it was unclear at that point what this next iteration, if indeed this you know, law of sevens you know, holds any water, um, what that would be. Now, it's become clear in the last you know, year or so that that's clearly going to be all about VR. Now, a few caveats there. Um, first of all, you can argue that 2017, we're not there yet, obviously, and you know, VR has already arrived. And that's true to a certain extent. Um, the 2017 moment, I think, might be when we start to see VR creep out of early adopter stages. At that point, we're going to have the three main kind of HMDs in the marketplace. You're going to have the Rift. HTC Vive, and the PlayStation VR, and probably several others. So that's going to create a lot of price competition and things that lower the barriers to adoption. Now, the second caveat is everything I went over so far is largely just mobile technologies. And you could argue that that's apples to oranges, because at least at early stages uh, with VR, um, especially due to the kind of heavy graphical processing requirements, it's largely a stationary experience, um, notwithstanding things like cardboard and um, the Gear VR, which are, are very mobile. Um, but the point of all of this is that it's, you know, at, at a broad level, it's, again, a, a, a hardware, hardware usually comes first in these cycles, a hardware-based innovation um, upon which there's going to be years of third-party innovation and development and content that builds on that, um, just like I mentioned for the iPhone. Now, also like the iPhone, it's going to create a robust ecosystem of supporting parts. Um, DigiCapital pegs it as a $30 billion opportunity when you look at the whole value chain of hardware, content, games, video, all that stuff. And it's also going to um, hit a lot of different verticals and different use cases, which is a key point, just like the iPhone did in terms of opening marketplaces in everything from retail and commerce to enterprise to education um, to our topic today, which is sports and entertainment. So um, kind of in closing, the other reason I mentioned the iPhone is that we're at now kind of like an iPhone one moment with VR, and especially with respect to the content. So a lot of people often forget that the first year of the iPhone, before the App Store came out, the App Store that we now know, the first year we were stuck with those like 17 apps right there, which really limited the use cases and the appeal uh, to the point of just kind of impacting the penetration and unit sales. So the historical parallel is that 
right now with VR, there just simply isn't enough content to sway the masses uh, to kind of get over some of those um, pricing barriers to adoption and, and, and things like that. Um, so we're not yet at those like smartphone-like penetration numbers of like hundreds of millions of units sold. We're just not there yet. So conversely, content creators, without that addressable market of installed bases of devices, find it hard to justify the business case to invest in long form and high quality, high production quality content. So it's a classic kind of chicken and egg dilemma that we see with emerging tech marketplaces. So that's all really to say that we at the VRAR Association are very bullish and very supportive of any companies or technologies that are working to seed the content side of that equation. So that's the content itself, that's the, the equipment to capture the content, the GoPros of the world, um, it's anyone improving the economics of VR content creation and distribution. Now, that happens on two levels, and I just want to make a distinction to kind of frame our discussion today. The first level it happens on is with you know, high production value, cinematic content, or sometimes graphical content, like what you see created by a gaming engine. Um, definitely a, a huge market, and we're spending a lot of time looking at that. But our topic today is the kind of lower hanging fruit, but still very important, uh, live action capture. Um, and when I say live, it's not necessarily consumed live, although that is sometimes the case as we're going to go over. But the point is that it is non-scripted live action capture, such as sports or, or user-generated content. And that's really kind of where we're zeroing in on today, in case that helps frame the overall discussion and where it sits in the whole overall VR spectrum. Um, now, um, in fairness to GoPro, they're actually attacking both of these. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to now um, turn it over uh, to GoPro. Uh, Kevin, are you, are you ready to go? Okay. Uh, Kevin Custer, everyone. <laughs> 